Okay, everybody. I'm Carver. I'm a alcoholic and an addict. It's so good to see you guys again. I'm uh, I'm grateful to be here. My qualifications to be here are I've been sober all day long, and it's been a long day. Let me tell you. So we're going to do the first three steps uh, out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. So grab your big book and get a highlighter and a pen. And we're going to take the steps as it was done in the 1940s. And in the 1940s, in the beginner meetings, as if this was one of those beginner meetings, we'd be here and there'd be me or somebody at the podium and they'd be reading these passages. So we start at the very beginning. So with your big book, now I want you to highlight, you have a big book, have a highlighter if you got one and a pen, and we're going to start at the very beginning. So this is the forward uh, to the first edition, Roman numeral 13, XIII. I'm going to read passages, and every passage that I read is a key passage that was used in the 1940s. So start highlighting with me the very first line on the forward to the first edition. We of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholics precisely how we've recovered is the main purpose of the book. So we learn a few things. We learn that we learn the purpose of the book is to show us how to recover. We also learn that even in the 1940s, alcoholics lied because it wasn't more than 100. It was 87. They was we was lying then. We's lying today. I call it hyperbole. My wife says, no, you're lying. She is an Al-Anon. She just tells me the truth. It can be annoying at times, but God bless her and I love her. I need the, I need the accountability. So what are we recovering from? The book tells us what we're recovering from, a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. So it doesn't mention alcohol, and I just want to do by show of hands, you know, there's a lot of different things that brought us here tonight that put us into recovery. Some of us have a problem with alcohol. Some of it's something else. Uh, some of us may, may be here because we love someone who struggles with addiction, but I'll tell you, one of the things that binds us all together is this sense of hopelessness. So I want to ask you one of the questions by show of hands, who here that in your experiences of life, has it ever felt hopeless? Raise your hand. Exactly. So why don't we, you know, one thing to, in order to, to neutralize our experience, what if we were to take the steps on hopelessness and then we don't have to worry about what brought us here. The solution is the same. Now look down at the last line on that very same page. And I want you to highlight the next key passage. We're gonna talk about the fellowships. It says, we are not an organization. See that the very last line on, on Roman numeral 13. We are not an organization in the conventional sense of the word. Boy, they got that right. You know, this is, this is no uh, mother's morning out uh, where we go, I'm just telling you. There's no fees or dues whatsoever. The only requirement for membership is an honest desire to stop drinking. But if you want to neutralize the experience, you could scratch that out if drinking didn't a thing for you and you could put change, right? Because nothing changes unless something changes. So the only requirement for membership is an honest desire to stop drinking or to change. We are not allied with any particular faith, sect, or denomination, nor do we oppose anyone. We simply wish to be helpful to those who are afflicted. Let's break that passage down. So, so any of us, did y'all know that there's over 300 different anonymous fellowships that practice the 12 steps? One of my favorite new ones is Under Earners Anonymous. Anybody got Tuesday free? Yeah, that's, I'm just, just saying. Anyway, that's sidebar. Um, but those of us who practice the 12 steps, 
what that passage is saying is we're not a religion. We don't get ourselves involved in science, politics, or medicine. We're just a bunch of people trying to be helpful to those who are afflicted in the same way we are. And that's one reason why the 12 Steps has splintered into so many different anonymous fellowships. Now, I want to remind you, there's two purposes of what we're going to do today. Number one, we're going to take the steps together and we're going to start feeling better together. Number two, I want to show you a way with your big book, how you can take somebody through the steps in this method. Now, in order to do that, you need to make yourself some little notes. So at the bottom of the page right there, I want you to get your pen and I want you to write this on the bottom of the page, write what do we have to offer? What do we have to offer? And it's on page 17. See, you're going to be sitting with a newcomer one day, and you're going to read those first couple of patches, passages, rather, and you're going to say to the newcomer, you know, you may be wondering what we have to offer. Well, it's over on page 17. Now, the newcomer is going to think you're a genius because you've memorized the book, but you haven't. You made yourself little notes, you know, in here. So just like me, you cheated. Now, we just let newcomer, if they want to choose to think we're geniuses, we just let them. That's their business. But flip over with me to page 17 not Roman numeral, regular page 17, which is chapter two. And if you'll find the last paragraph on that page, that's the next key passage to highlight. Page 17, chapter two, last paragraph. This answers the question, what do we have to offer? And here's what the passage says, highlight with me. The tremendous fact, for every one of us is that we've discovered a common solution, a solution that'll work for every one of us, no matter who we are, where we come from, even people in Mississippi. We have a way out on which we can absolutely agree and upon which we can join in brotherly and harmonious action. This is the great news this book carries to those who suffer from alcoholism. You could also write in their hopelessness too. So, so what is that saying? What, what's that passage saying? Well, what's the title of the chapter? Reach up there and highlight there is a solution. You know, that's something that we kind of take for granted, you know, in a way. You know, of course there's a solution. My goodness, I could tee up a golf ball and if I keep my head down and hit it square with a three wood, I could probably hit a treatment center. You know, I mean, there's AA meetings all over the place. There's inpatient, outpatient, overpatient, underpatient. There's all kinds of stuff everywhere. But that passage was written in 1939. In 1939, there was no solution. Addicts died. They died on the streets. They died in prison. They died in sanatoriums. You know, Bill Wilson himself was just about ready to be committed permanently to a mental health hospital. You know, he had been to the hospital four times and, and, and his wife Lois was getting a little worn out by the whole thing. Um, you know, thank God that, that he got that reprieve. So the next key passage at the bottom of the page or somewhere on that page, we're going to talk about the symptoms. If addiction is a disease, then it's got to have symptoms. And we ought to look at the symptoms, even if we're a family member, we ought to look at the symptoms just to make sure to see if we qualify. If we don't have the symptoms. I don't know. Maybe we don't have the disease. So at the bottom of the page, right our symptoms or symptoms of my problem. And you could also put mental and physical. Remember that first passage, it talked about a, 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 an affliction of mind and body. That means that we've got mental situations, mental symptoms, as well as physical symptoms. Now, the page number of where those are is back at the front in the doctor's opinion. So write down, 
It's Roman numeral 28. It's XXVIII. We're going to answer the question of what are my symptoms on XXVIII. So flip with me and go back to the front, <clears throat> find the doctor's opinion, locate Roman numeral 28 XXVIII, and then look down at the bottom and find the last paragraph. Does it start men and women? Give me a nod if it does. Oh my gosh, I'm getting it right. I can't believe it. This is a, it's a, it's a recovery miracle. Okay, so highlight with me right there, men and women. We're gonna start with symptoms. So here's what it says. Men and women drink, honestly, they'll do whatever they do, essentially because they like the effect produced by doing it or by alcohol. Now that's just basic human nature. I have a propensity to enjoy myself Skittles. And if there happens to be a bowl full of Skittles hanging around, I could very likely embarrass myself because I like the effect of Skittles. They don't just taste great. They taste fantastic. They hit a place in my brain that just sort of goes off. I don't know what about that. That's a whole nother story though. So basic human nature, keep highlighting. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, causing us injury, they cannot after a time differentiate the true from the false. Let's pause for a second. I'm going to ask you another question. By show of hands, who here doing whatever it was that wound us up here on this Zoom tonight, have you ever had difficulty telling the difference between true or false? Raise your hand. Good Lord, I did. One of the great lies I used to tell myself was, I'm not hurting anybody but me. And then we had family night at the treatment center. That was a problem. Uh, that, that, that little notion didn't hold up well on family night, just saying. So keep highlighting. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. They are restless, irritable, and discontented unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks or going back to old behaviors. Drinks are behaviors they see others taking with impunity. In other words, getting away with it. I want you to get your pen and I want you to underline restless, irritable, and discontented. And right out to the side, you can write symptoms of my problem. Restless, irritable, discontented. Can I tell you a confession? I want you to know God got me sober on June the 14th, 2004, and I get restless and I get irritable and I can get discontented. I just want you to know. But I want you to know that I got a sponsor early on. I was really blessed to get a sponsor. And my sponsor told me exactly what to do when I feel restless, irritable, and discontented. I, I, I drive the world's smallest Honda. I go up and down these highways in Mississippi. Some of them are paved. And we have this phenomenon called meth-addicted dump truck drivers, and they can just sort of move you out of the way. And they drop their pipes and are reaching down and the trucks just sort of wind up. And then my little old Honda just winds up over to the side. And I have this propensity that I want to do something that's very, very unrecovery. I'd like to chase them. Now, one thing I've learned in recovery is I no longer chase people past my exit. It's a miracle. Now, so I just want you to know that anytime I feel restless, I feel irritable, or I feel discontented, I do, I apply this that my sponsor told me early on. And this comes out of the big book. We'll look at this again in, in, the, in the tenth step. But the very first thing my sponsor told me he said, the first thing that I want you to do is non-negotiable. These are, write these down. These are the three recovery activities. This is the things we basically do every day. 
And my sponsor told me, if I'll do these three things, my life will change. Yes, we're going to take the steps, but we also follow these three activities. The first one he said was non-negotiable. How about that? Sounded important to me. He said, if, if you can't could do the first one, he said, I'm not going to be able to help you. You know, we could go to meetings together, have lunch, do things. He says, I'm just not going to be able to help you. He asked me if I wanted to know what the first one was. And I said, I really do. He said, the first one is this. He said, we pray. We pray on our knees every day and ask God to keep us sober. He said, you, while you're down there, you can pray for people or say the Our Father or anything else you want to. But he says, every day, on our knees, we ask God to keep you sober. It's the foundation of all recovery. All recovery begins and ends with prayer. All recovery begins and ends on our knees, asking God to keep us sober. My sponsor asked me if I was willing to do it. I said, well, I said, you know, you know, I used to be a praying guy, not so much now. I'm not sure if my prayers make it past the ceiling, you know. I just, I don't really know. You know, I went on and explained to him my views of the universe. And after a long dissertation, the first time I took a breath, he looked at me with all the love a man can muster. And he said, I don't care. He said, I don't care what you think. I'm not asking you to think, certainly not. I don't, I don't care what you believe. I'm not asking you to believe anything. He said, I'm just simply asking you to do it. Will you do it? And I thought, oh my goodness, that sounds important. I said, well, I'll, I'll, sure, I'll sure try to do that. He said, well, yeah, but here's the discipline. He says, within a couple of weeks, you're going to forget. You're going to wake up late one morning, probably not going to comb your hair, but probably will put your glasses on, God willing, brush your teeth. You're going to jump in the car, going to be driving along, and you're going to realize you forgot to do the one most important thing that I ask you to do. And in that moment, he said, the disease of addiction is going to speak to you. And he says, and, and when the disease speaks to you, he says, I want you to stop what you're doing. I want you to go find a bathroom. I want you, or a closet or somewhere private. I want you to get on your knees and ask God to keep you sober. And he says, and then go on about your day. And if you can do that, he said, then you'll never drink again. Now, how about that for a promise? If I could do that, he said, you, you'll never drink again. Well, just like he was Notre Dame or something, like two weeks to the day, I'm driving along and I realize I forgot to do the one most important thing he asked me to do. I kind of little sweat BBs, you know, kind of got on my forehead. I heard the disease speak to me, telling me that this thing wasn't going to work, that I'd already screwed it up. And I, with a panic, I looked up and the first place I saw was Wendy's you know, with the pigtails. About 10 in the morning, I pulled over into the Wendy's parking lot. I went in the side door. I looked to my right. There was the bathroom. I went to the end of the bathroom. I went in the bathroom. There's nobody there. I went in the stall. I closed the stall door. I got on my knees and I said, God, please help me stay sober today. And please help me remember to do this at home because this is disgusting. I got up, I washed my hands real good. And I got one of those phones. Remember the phones the size of shoe boxes, you know, with the long antenna, you know, you had to kind of hold them like that. And I dialed him up and it went to his answer machine. Anybody remember answer machines? And so, and I told, left him a message and told him what happened. And he called me back later that day and he said to me, Sounds like to me, you're one of the ones that never wants to drink again. I hadn't. How about that? So the second most important thing is we attend those meetings. You need to be conspicuously absent if you're not going to those meetings on a regular basis. I really believe, and gosh, now with Zoom meetings, there, man, we can do meetings 
I really believe in the 90 meetings in 90 days. Anytime I feel a little restless, I'll double up on my meetings and really reconnect. You know, you can't be a member of a fellowship you don't attend. And my sponsor told me the third most important thing is we share from the heart. He said, they say it at every AA meeting, Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share. If you don't share, you're not being a member. So if you wanna be a member, you need to share. So the three most important things that we do, and this is every time we're restless, irritable, and discontented, these are the three things we do. Do every day if you can. We pray on our knees, ask God to keep us sober. We attend those meetings on a regular basis and we share from the heart. And I promise you, if you will commit to just to those three things and nothing else, I promise you, your life will change. You'll never look back. All right, let's go back to the book. I'm over on Roman numeral 29, right where we left off. It's three lines down from the top of the page. We're gonna finish up with the symptoms. And it says, after they have succumbed, y'all see that? After they have succumbed to the desire again, as so many do, and the phenomenon of craving develops, they pass through the well-known stages of a spree. Yippee, you know, a spree. Emerging remorseful, oh Lord, what have I done? With a firm resolution not to drink again, I swear I will never do it again. You know, not in Louisiana, I will stay at home. This is repeated over and over. It's like a circle. It's like a trap. And unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there's very little hope of his recovery. Well, that's good news and bad news. The good news is there's hope of my recovery. And all I need to do is have a psychic change. The bad news is where in the world do you have a psych? How do you have a psychic change? They don't tell you how, you know? I mean, I need, I need it quick, so I'm going to have to order it on Amazon Prime and hope it gets here in two days, free shipping, because I don't pay retail and I don't pay shipping. Anyway, that's a sidebar. All right, at the bottom of the page, I want you to write more symptoms. At, you're going to, the newcomer, you're going to say to the newcomer, hey, let's look at more symptoms. It's on page 44. Newcomer's going to think you're a genius. You me memorized the book, but you hadn't because you cheated. So you write more symptoms, page 44, and then turn with me to page 44. So page 44, which is chapter four, and I want you to start four lines down from the top of the page. Do you see where it says, if, when? Am I going too fast? Y'all see it? Okay, start highlighting with if, when. If, this is more symptoms. If, when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely. That's a key word. Or if when drinking or doing whatever you're doing, you have little control over the amount you do, you are probably an alcoholic or you probably have a problem. Does that make sense? And here's, you know, if you got something you can't stop entirely or you can't control it, this is, this just trust me, this is a problem. Here's the next line, this is money. If that be the case, you may be suffering from an illness which only a spiritual experience will conquer. So the authors of the book started off by talking about a psychic change and they change the dialogue at this point and call it a spiritual experience. Well, it kind of lends me to the same dadgum dilemma. If I'm supposed to, you know, in order to recover, if I'm supposed to have a spiritual experience, well, how am I supposed to have that? Where at Walmart am I supposed to get a spiritual experience? It's probably near the yoga mats and the candles, but I can't find it. All right, hold your place there and flip over to page 59. Hold your place and flip over to 59. You see all the steps written there? Okay, now flip over to page 60. Do you see step 12? Okay, do you see the second word on step 12? It's had. 
the tense is past, past tense, had a what? Had a spiritual awakening. So this is what I imply from that. By the time you get to step 12, you've already had a spiritual awakening. So I just want you to know I knocked off a step for you. All you got to do is 11. You've already had the spiritual awakening. And well, anyway, you seem like a bunch of skeptics. So I'm going to take you through the whole thing. So we're going to do all 12. But I'm just saying the big book promises after step 11, you've already had a spiritual awakening. I'm just saying. All right. Go back to page 44. Now, I want you to notice, can you, can you see that everything we've been doing is all powerless? Everything we've talked about is powerless, powerless, powerless. But that's only the first half of the first step. The second half of the first step is unmanageability. That's something different. So at the bottom of the page, write unmanageability. Page 52. We're going to diagnose our unmanageability, and it's on page 52. So you're going to tell the newcomer, let's flip over to page 52 and let's look at unmanageability. Newcomer's going to say, I don't know what you're talking about, but I'm going to do it. Page 52. Now, this is the third paragraph right in the middle of the page, and it's the second sentence in that paragraph. Do you see where it says we were having trouble? Y'all got that? All right, start highlighting right there, and let's go through and see how many of these that we might have. It says we were having trouble with personal relationships. Anybody? Just me? Oh, oh okay, several. We couldn't control our emotional natures. Anybody been having trouble controlling your emotional natures? We were a prey to misery and depression. Anybody been miserable? Anybody been depressed? Boy, you gotta move to Mississippi. I'll show you what it's all about. We couldn't make a living. Anybody been not living life to the fullest? That's what I'm talking about. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. Anybody got any fear cooking? Hello. We were unhappy. Anybody been unhappy? Yep, yep, yep. And we couldn't seem to be of any real help to other people. Now, by a show of hands, how many here could identify with at least one or more of those? Raise your hand and welcome to the unmanageable life. There you go. So we qualified for powerlessness. We qualified for unmanageability. Guess what? I think it's time to take the first step. At the bottom of the page, write step one, page 30. Do you see how these passages jump all over the place? How do you think a newcomer could ever figure out how to go through all of this? That's why I have a personal opinion that I think it's really a problem to hand a newcomer a big book and say, write this and call me, or read this and call me. Who could find all these passages? It don't make no sense. My sponsor gave me my first big book. I started reading that crazy thing. I got to page 25. It talked about being rocketed on, under the fourth dimension of existence. I told him, the book that you gave me, the people that wrote it were high. I already know how to be rocketed into the fourth dimension of existence. I don't need your book to show me and your meetings are adorable. And I like how y'all put dollar bills in the little plate that you pass around like it's the Boy Scouts or something, you know? And he said, we'll keep coming back. I didn't understand what he was talking about. Turn to page 30. This is gonna be step one. All right, so find the second paragraph on page 30 and get your highlighter. Here's the first step. Do you see where it says we learned? Y'all got it? You look studious. Okay, we learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics, or if you're not alcoholic, or that we had a problem that we couldn't solve on our own. Does that make sense? 
This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we are like other people or presently has to be smashed or presently maybe has to be smashed. My sponsor read that to me. I said, well, how do you smash the delusion that I don't have this problem? He said, that's easy. He says, I'm going to ask you the first step question. And all you have to do is answer me out loud with a yes or a no. I'm going to ask you guys the first step question. And all you have to do is answer me out loud with a show of hands and a yes or a no. Y'all ready? Here's the first step question. Are you willing to concede to your innermost self that you have a problem that you have not been able to solve on your own? Is that a yes? Yeah. Everybody that nodded yes, said yes, raised your hand, gave me a thumbs up. You just took the first step and nothing more is required. Congratulations. If the first step is making an admission by dingy, you just made an admission. All right. So let's do, look at the bottom of that page. Get your pen out. I want you to write step two, lack of power page 45. Step two, lack of power, page 45. The second step is we're going to come to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. You know, that lack of power, you know, if I had the power to solve this problem, I would have done it about 30 years ago. You know, I mean, the fact that I am still suffering with this problem for so long indicates that I obviously don't have the power. If I had the power, I'd have used it. You follow me? So it's step two, lack of power, page 45. So let's turn to page 45. Find the second paragraph on page 45 and highlight along with me lack of power. That was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than ourselves, obviously. But where and how are we to find that power? Well, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself that will solve your problem. That means that we have written a book which we believe to be spiritual as well as moral, and it means, of course, we're going to talk about God. Now, I want to clear something up. The big book does not use the word God for any religious purpose. Don't get tied up too much on names right there. You know, the big book uses a whole bunch of terms to describe this power, and you're free to call it anything you want. Um, it, some of the terms that the big book uses are creative intelligence, spirit of the universe, great reality, broad highway, anything you're comfortable with, you can call this power. You know, the, the book uses the term God more of a matter of convenience and certainly for no religious uh, reason. So at the bottom of that page, I want you to write this, where to find the power. Like, if there's a power that's going to help me, where is it? Where to find the power, page 55. Where to find the power, page 55. And then flip over with me to page 55. Find the third paragraph on page 55. It starts with actually, kind of near the top. And I think this is one of the prettiest sections of the book. And so it says, this is answering the question, where is this crazy power that's going to help me? It says, actually, we were fooling ourselves for deep down in every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God. It may be obscured by calamity, by pomp, by worship of other things, but in some form or other, it's there. For faith in a power greater than ourselves and miraculous demonstrations of that power in human lives are facts as old as man himself. We finally saw that faith in some kind of a God was a part of our makeup, 
just as much as the feeling we had for a friend. Sometimes we had to search fearlessly, but he was there. He was as much a fact as we were. We found the great reality deep down within us. That great reality, capital G, capital R, that's a term for the higher power and underlined deep down within us. That's a, that's a key line. Where is the power deep down within us? In the last analysis, it's only there that he may be found. We can only clear the ground a bit. If our testimony helps sweep away prejudice, enables you to think honestly, encourages you to search diligently within yourself, underline that, underline search diligently within yourself. That is money right there. Then, if you wish, you can join us on the broad highway. There's another term for the higher power, capital B, capital H. With this attitude, you cannot fail. The consciousness of your belief is sure to come to you. You know, every time I read that passage, it reminds me of the Wizard of Oz. How many of y'all, any, any of y'all see the movie, The Wizard of Oz? Did y'all see it? Well, for anybody that didn't see it, I'm going to do the movie for you. So Dorothy's this little girl. She, she's, she grows up. She grows up with and being raised by her aunt and uncle. Now, the, the movie never tells you where mom and dad are. I happen to know they were meth cooks in Missouri. And there was an explosion in the trailer. And the popo showed up. And, and then DHS showed up and scooped up Dorothy and sent her off to Kansas. And she was very unhappy about the whole thing. Remember how angry she was? She wasn't getting along with the people on the farm. She didn't like her chores. She wasn't getting along with her aunt. And she for darn sure did not like Kansas. One night during a terrible storm, she leaves home and joins a gang. Wasn't a big gang. It was a little gang. First thing they do is steal some fruit. They run them along. They find them some poppies. They chop them up, cook them in a microwave, smoke them, pass out in a field. They're totally whacked out of their minds. They're tweaking bad. They're seeing trees talking to them. They're seeing monkeys flying around. At the end of the movie, they wind up in a crack house and they see this woman dissolve in front of them. They're totally freaked out. They have PTSD and they have to go see the good therapist for EMDR therapy. Y'all saw the movie, right? At the end of the movie, Dorothy is doing a session with the good therapist and, and she tells the good therapist, I just want to get out of pavilion. I just want to go home. Good therapist says, Dorothy, ain't no gates on this place. You can walk out, walk home anytime you wanted to. Dorothy gets pissed. Toto almost bites her. The codependent scarecrow has been listening in. He goes into rescue mode. He steps in front of Dorothy and he says, why didn't you tell her? Y'all got to watch this part. The good therapist is so well-trained. She never takes her eyes off Dorothy, but you can almost sense she's thinking to herself, I'll deal with you at family night. But she answers the very valid, yeah, that's a valid question. If you had the solution to her problem, why the heck didn't you tell her? The good therapist with a big old smile on her face looks at Dorothy and the line that she says is a great line for you and me. She says to Dorothy, if I'd have told you, you wouldn't have believed me. Isn't that a great line? I mean, how many people withdrew the solution to, from me? Because I, I wasn't in a position to, to believe them. Just like Dorothy, I had to go all around this crazy land and all this nonsense and insanity until finally alcoholism had to give me my last great ass whooping. 
you know, before I was finally beaten into submission and I was going to willing to listen to somebody. But the truth is, and here's the, here's the reality, just like Dorothy, the problem that I, the greatest problem I ever had in my whole life, bar none, I carried the solution into the treatment center with me. See, it had been buried, I think, in the last place I would have ever thought to look, and that was right in my own heart. Because addiction robs us of matters of the heart. Addiction separates us from the people that love us, the people that we love. Addiction separates us from our feelings. I think the solution that I had was with me the whole time, just like Dorothy, I just didn't know how to connect with it. And the whole purpose of the steps is to show us how to reconnect with a power that exists each, inside each and every one of us so that we can overcome and find the lives that we were meant to have. So at the bottom of that page, I want you to write, what if you don't believe? What if you don't believe page 46? What if you don't believe it's on page 46 and find the paragraph right in the middle of the page and the third sentence, it's right in the middle of the page on 46. Do you see where it says we found? We found that as soon as we were able to lay aside prejudice and express even a willingness I want you to underline the word willingness to believe in a power greater than ourselves. We commenced to get results, even though it was impossible for any of us to fully define or comprehend that power, which is God. We could do, we could do an hour just on that one line. So my sponsor said, you, you know, I said to him, well, I said, what if I don't know what if I believe? I don't know how to believe. He says, you don't got to believe to take the second step. You just got to be willing to believe. And I said, well, I don't even know how to do that. How do I be willing to believe? He said, that's easy. And this is what he said. He said, do you believe that I believe? If you believe that I believe, then that's you being willing. That's the door opening up just enough to let a little ray of light of hope come in. And that's all it takes to take the second step. At the bottom of the page, write second step question, page 47. Second step question is on page 47. And then look over on page 47 and find the second paragraph. The second paragraph on page 47 and highlight with me, we needed to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe or am I even willing to believe that there's a power greater than myself? As soon as a man says that he does believe or is even willing to believe, we emphatically assure him he is on his way. It's been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. I'm going to ask you the second step question, and all you have to do is raise your hand and wave or say yes or give me a thumbs up or any sort of gesture of, of affirmation. And here's the second step question. Do you now believe or do you believe that I believe that there's a power greater than you? What's your answer? Everybody that waved, nodded, did something, just took the second step, and nothing more is required of you. Congratulations. It's that simple. At the bottom of the page, write step three, a life run on self-will, page 60. Step three, a life run on self-will, page 60. Step three says we're going to make a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand him. The opposite of doing that is for me to continue to run the show. I, pr I have proven time and again to be a relatively bad manager of my life. I managed my way right into a residential mental health hospital. 
I'm a reasonably bad manager. I'm just saying. So page 60, last paragraph. Page 60, last paragraph. Do you see where it says the first requirement? That means the first requirement of doing step three is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. On that basis, we're almost always in collision with something or somebody, even though our motives are good. Most people try to live by self-propulsion. Each person is like an actor who wants to run the whole show, is forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, and the rest of the players in his own way. Does that sound familiar? Let me ask it again. Haven't each of us tried to convince people that they would be better off if they just did things our way. Attempting to control other people, that's one of the characteristics of selfishness. And it's selfishness that blocks us from the power to get better. On the bottom of the page, write, selfishness blocks us from God, page 62. Selfishness blocks us from God, page 62. Then turn to page 62, find the second paragraph and highlight along with me. It says selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. We step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation, but we invariably find that at some time in the past, we have made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. So our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves and the alcoholic or the hope, hopeless person is an extreme example of self-will run riot, though he usually doesn't think so. Above everything, we alcoholics must be rid of this selfishness. We must or it kills us. Wow, God makes that possible, and there often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. Jump down to the next paragraph. This is the how and the why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Next, we decided that hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. Jump down two lines. Most good ideas are simple, and this concept was the keystone of a new and triumphant arch through which we passed to freedom. Top of page 63. When we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer. Being all powerful, he provided what we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. Everybody jump down to the next paragraph and what does it say? We are now at step three. Guess where you are? You're sitting at step three. It says, many of us said to our maker as we understood him, now, if you want to do the third step prayer with me, you can say this with me. I would ask you, say this with me out loud. You can unmute for a minute. You can say it to yourself. You can do whatever you want. But if you want to do this with me exactly the way I did with my sponsor, this can be absolute recovery chaos. We can all unmute and say it together. We won't know what we're saying. And so you ready? You want to do it with me? Okay, say this with me. God, God I offer myself to I offer you myself to, you. to build with you me and to do with me, do with me as thou wilt. Relieve, Relieve me of the bondage of bondage self, self that I may better, I better do thy will. Take, take away, take my, away my difficulty. That victory, that victory over them, them may, may bear, bear witness to, to those to I would help, help of thy, thy power, power thy, thy love, love, 
and thy way of life. Way of life. May I do yeah. thy will. Do thy will. will always. always. You just took the third step. You just took all three, the first three steps. Now, everybody mute for a second. I'm going to do the, I'm going to do that prayer for you again in English. I had somebody, I had somebody tell me, can we do that prayer again in English? I said, absolutely. Well, let's do it in English. So here's the prayer. You guys just kind of follow along with me. And the way the prayer goes in English is God. I have a problem. I have not been able to solve it. Good Lord, I've tried. Even brought me here on this Zoom meeting. I don't even know why. So I need your help. And I need it today. Because I am very impatient. We'll, we'll talk about that later. So thank you for being there. And thank you for not giving up on me. We will talk again soon, maybe tonight, but for sure in the morning. Bye. The third step prayer. So I want you guys to know, remember those three things that we talked about at the very, very beginning. We pray on our knees. We ask God to keep us sober. We attend those meetings on a regular basis and we share from the heart. I want you to know that if you make a commitment to get on your knees every morning and ask God to keep you sober, then every morning you're taking the first three steps. If you, if you get up in the morning, you get on your knees, then if you don't have a problem, then what are you doing on the floor? If you don't believe there's a power that could help you, then why are you wasting your time praying? And if you're asking God to just keep you sober or in recovery for the day, isn't that the simplest of all third step prayers? The simplest of all third step prayers, two words, help me, help me. Simplest of all prayers. I wanted to finish with this. You guys all know, that addiction is one of the most powerful forces on the face of the earth. But I want to tell you this, recovery is more powerful. But recovery has one drawback. It only works for 24 hours. So the prayer I did yesterday is insufficient to keep me sober today. The meeting that I went to yesterday isn't going to be enough to keep me sober today. The sharing that I did yesterday is insufficient to keep me sober today. I need to do it today. And I think the fact that you and I spent this time together today is a pretty good indication that we're on the right track to feel better. I think we're going to be just fine. I love you guys. I want you to know somebody prayed for you today because I did. I love you all. And, um, I'll see you next week and we'll do steps four and five. All I can tell you, Fred, is my sponsor told me that I needed to share. He said, because he noticed, he noticed that I was attending the meetings and I wasn't saying anything. And, and so he said, you know, if I didn't share, you know, that I really wasn't being a member and I needed to share, and I didn't need to pontificate. I just needed to, I just needed to say if I identified with the topic, you know, if I, if I, you know, just, you know, just, it was just, it was more of a matter of identification. There's a way to attend an anonymous fellowship anonymously and nobody will ever know you. And I think people drift in and drift out, you know, and all. So I think, I think there's kind of two people, Fred. I think there's some of the people that have a, a, a tendency and they want to say everything all the time and they probably do need to keep a little more quiet. And then there's people like me who are just shy and they didn't want to say anything and they were too hurt and just really being quiet and kind of needed to come out of our shell and, and share a little, share a little more. But 
I, you know, I, all I can tell you is 17 years ago, that was, that was kind of what happened to me. He really wanted me to share it at meeting level. Great question, Fred. So as soon as my sponsor took me through the steps and we finished step 12, which really was a matter of about two weeks, he said, now we're going to pray you up a newcomer. I said, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to do what to a who water? He says, no, no, no. We're going to pray you up a newcomer. I said, I am a newcomer. He said, how much time have you got? I said, I had, I got 39 days. He said, well, he said, you know more. He says, the guy coming in, picking up 24 hours, he wants to know a whole lot more about how to pick up 39 days than he cares anything about 17 years. He doesn't care nothing. 17 years, go, go have lunch somewhere. 39 days, how in the heck did you do 39 days? He said, and you just did it. Can't you tell somebody what you just did? I think we get a little too caught up in terms sometimes, you know, sponsor, sponsor, you know, I think, I think Fred, as soon as we go through this, I think you are ready to sit down with the newcomer and just follow through with these passage. Remember, remember, we're not in the results business. I, you know, I, I, I told my sponsor one time early on, I said, Gosh, I said, I don't think anybody's staying sober, you know, or I don't know what they're doing. You know, they, I sit down with them. We go over some big book passages. I never see them again. I give out my phone number. Nobody calls. I said, I don't know what's going on. He says, well, let me ask you this. Are you sober? I said, well, yeah, I'm sober. He said, then your sponsorship is 100% successful because that's the key to this whole thing. It's not about what happens with them. I'm not doing this for them. I'm doing this for me. I'm doing, I'm here right now so that I can stay sober today. I don't know what anybody's ever gonna do with this stuff I, I, I you know, send out, but it doesn't matter. I just need to keep, I need to keep spreading this message so that I can stay sober. So Fred, I think once you go through all of this, find you a pigeon, sit down over a mug of coffee, <laughs> read big book passages together and uh, you know, and just don't worry about what happens. Then just move to the next one. And if the guy sticks with you and keeps coming, God bless America. Yeah, you bet. So this process yielded a 50 to a 75% recovery rate in the 1940s. And they, they took copious notes and, and very careful records. Uh, they knew who the members were. And, uh, and, and, and back to Fred's point, you know, the way they did it was you, you attended these four one hour sessions. You took all 12 steps and then immediately you were assigned to sit with the next newcomer. And so you did this again. And only then were you allowed to, to get your membership card. Do I have my wallet? I still didn't bring my wallet. Uh, the membership card that would be your, you'd be a card carrying member of Alcoholics Anonymous. So, so it, this thing was wildly effective, um, you know, because, because, you know, everybody who was a member had taken all 12 steps, was already, was already helping somebody else and, and was all, and read all the, the material. And, and today, I think we're just not seeing anywhere near those results because over half the people have never taken the all 12 steps. Over half the people don't have a sponsor and over half the people have never read any of the material. And so, um, yeah, did that, did that, is that what I was supposed to say? I've heard of it. I, you know, I practice, you know, my prayers are just conversational, you know, I just, you know, thank you. It's really thank you and help me. It's thank you for all the blessings. You know, I just, I'm, I'm just overwhelmed with gratitude because literally at this point, everything in my life comes from recovery. I, I wouldn't be anywhere um, if, it, if it wasn't for recovery. I was dying. I was 47 years old and I was dying. 
and uh, and then and then the, the other of it is is just the notion that the blessings of God, the longer we're sober, the blessings of God create more unmanageability. You know, I wasn't burdened with, with the responsibility of being a loving husband. I wasn't burdened with the responsibility of being a father or being a good employee, you know. But all as those blessings have come to me, now I, there's more unmanageability. It's, it's harder it's not easier. It's, it's more challenging. And so I need, the, I don't need the program less. I need the program more. I need more of what the program has to offer than ever before in my life. So I think the mistake is, I think some view the blessings of life as being this call to less program. And I tend to view it the other way. I need more, not less. Thanks, everybody. Bye. You guys were great.